Namaste and greetings. I am Ishika Chaudhary, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evam Niti Anusandhan Sansthan, Nay Delhi. Extend my warm welcome to you all to IMPRI hashtag Web Policy Talk. Today we have gathered for a special talk on what does equal treatment mean in an urban society, learning gender equality through the account of Rifat B by Sanchita Ayan. As a part of the series, The State of Gender Equality, Hashtag Gender Gaps, organized by IMPRI Gender Impact Studies Center. Chair for the session is Professor Vibhuti Patel, eminent economist and former professor at TIS Mumbai. With the permission of our chair, I would like to introduce our speaker for today. Please introduce the speaker today. Thank you, Thank you ma'am. Yeah. Our speaker for today's episode of our hashtag gender gap series is Sanchita Ain. She holds a LLM degree from University of Essex and she has handled complex cases like uh, before Supreme Court and High Court like Triple Talaq, 2G Spectrum case, affirmative action, linking of PAN with Adhar rights of minority institutions and family laws. She is a people-oriented lawyer. Now I invite our chair for introductory remarks and invite the speaker. Ma'am, yeah. over to you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Good evening, friends. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Arjun Kumar for providing this platform to discuss such a sensitive issue. What does equal treatment mean in, a, in an urban society? Learning gender equality through account of Rifat B. I am also familiar with uh, Advocate Sanchita Ayn's very important contribution over last couple of years. Being a young lawyer, she has done so much in her career uh, that I applaud her commitment to gender justice. Uh, Constitution of India has granted uh, uh, fundamental rights. As per that, everyone, uh, equality, liberty, fraternity, equal treatment, they are uh, enshrined in the Constitution. We also got Equal Remuneration Act in 1976 when India signed the UN Charter of Equality, Development and Peace. And uh, first case, public interest litigation was also filed immediately. Discrimination is unjustified, unequal, uh, unequal treatment of people as a result of which one person is placed in a worse position than the other in the same or similar situation. And this is not allowed under Equal Remuneration Act. Uh, nationality, uh, ethnic origin, race, color, religion, and other beliefs, age, disability, sexual orientation, gender, these all are the intersectional marginalities which are created and as a result of which women suffer. Even in the pyramid of inequality and marginalization, women who are in the informal sector, who are in the so-called quote-unquote lower caste and Shudra and Nati Shudra women, they suffer the most. LGBTQIA community, they don't get equal uh, label playing field in the labor market. Uh, disability rights people are also saying that though there is a two percent reservation given for disabled persons with disability in the uh, employment field. But in reality, we see we are far away from any kind of a equal treatment, equal uh, opportunity and equal rewards uh, for the all citizens. So to promote, protect and ensure full and equal employment to all uh, for, uh, of all the human rights and fundamental freedoms by all persons with disability and also various types of socio-economic, educational, cultural disabilities and to promote respect for their inherent dignity, I think is the major aim of today's uh, session. And valuing diversity becomes very important uh, in this context. The term diversity refers to a value judgment and as well as the principle to increase tolerance and respect for differences. This is an underlying principle which presupposes the incorporation of equal treatment, respect for rights and involvement in general strategy of the organization, whether it is a public sector enterprises, private sector, uh, and now we are also asking for universalization of social security and social protection as per the ILO's uh, covenant, which India has signed about the uh, decent work and also no workplace violence. So today's special lecture by Advocate Sanchita Ayn will be critically reflecting on whether and how these lofty goals of equality are impacting life worlds of women in our country, 
through uh, okay, in social science, we talk about in-depth case analysis or qualitative bringing the nuances through qualitative research. But I think in the legal field also, it becomes a very important to go into the inner worlds of uh, women. And today uh, we are going to get opportunity for a, from a very erudite uh, speaker and a lawyer uh, but to, to uh, reflect on uh, how equal treatment is meted out in the urban context. Uh, over to Advocate Sanchita Ayn. Thank you so much, Professor Patel. Thank you so much. It was a, it was a lovely introduction. I don't think uh, a, such justice could have been done in such few words to the topic as you have done now. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Arjun Kumar. Thank you, Ashika. Thank you to Impact and Policy Research Institute for having these kind of discussions on, on a regular basis. Thank you so much for having me today. Uh, this is the first time I am going to share uh, who Rifat B is. Uh, now, Rifat B is a stranger for me who came in my dream. I had COVID, all of my, all the, my family members had COVID in April and my mother was in ICU. My dad and I had just being discharged and we were staying at the guest house when uh, during the early hours of the morning I was seeing this very very uh, vivid dream you know like there's this woman um, like not a well-built woman but a very ordinary woman who you wouldn't even notice right that woman telling me about her work, about her journey. So she took me to various places of the world. So at one point I was at Oxford Street in London where she's showing how she has helped in designing uh, high-end fashion brands. She's also been a model herself wearing the dress and then showing and, and this was an amazing dress, you know, I mean, I can't describe black and white and, and asymmetrical kind of very, very novel kind of design, where she's also wearing it and then explaining how it can be done in a better manner. Uh, but she's not a fashion designer, right? Then we go elsewhere, where she's uh, at Wall Street. And there's this way uh, nicely uh, clad gentleman who's roaming around and she's walking uh, behind him. And uh, she is, she's very enthusiastic. She's helping him with every, every piece of information, every piece of knowledge, all that she's briefing him. She has a file with her, which has all the information that the, this gentleman is now, you know, explaining to other people in, you know, kind of, you know, like, like I would say men do, right? So not in a derogatory manner, but, but this is something that really happens that they, uh, they can come across as, as people who have, have such amount of confidence. And then he's looking at another guy and he's saying, oh yes, I, you know what, I want to hire you how much would it cost me? And he's like, oh, I'm, I'm very, very pricey, right? So, uh, and whereas this woman is completely invisible in this whole act, I'm able to see her, but whatever interaction is happening there, she is quiet. She's not visible to the people in the room. Then uh, she takes me elsewhere and uh, there also she's, she's working in an office space and she's an amazing worker, uh, but uh, she's uh, not one of those directors and managing directors, etc. So uh, there also I realized how much she's contributing and how enthusiastic she is and she's very good at what she does. Um, so now I'm, I got very excited to see her doing so much. I mean, she's traveled so much, she's done so much and I was looking forward to more. When she says, but now I'm, my dad is going to carry me off and therefore I can't work. And it, I mean, I can just feel it. Like it's such a normal kind of a thing that happens in society. But she took me through those, that journey in such a way that it really hit me that you, you won't 
work anymore, really. And uh, she said, you know what, you don't know, she tells me, you don't know what you are doing. You, you, you don't know that you're fulfilling all our dreams. It's all in your hands. So you should really take care of yourself, right? Because you, you are the one, we, can, we, we will feel contented when we see you doing the stuff you do. And I was very, very touched. I woke up and I was like, I could really feel how, how much, uh, and this is not the first time that somebody has told me something of the sort. Um, there are people who have said in different ways. When I started doing webinars, for example, uh, a woman's, I, I was doing random webinars on, on topics, mainstream topics, right? And this woman tells me, and it was not doing on woman justice or anything of that sort, a woman in litigation. So she tells me, you know what, I wanted to join litigation, but there were problems and therefore I, you know, everyone in the society kind of tends to tell you that you should, women should not be doing uh, litigation and therefore I didn't and I started teaching, but now looking at you, I want to come to litigation. So, so I, I, I could see that similarity within those stories that, you know, you are fulfilling my dream and you don't know what you are doing because I'm, I'm never conscious about it. I'm just doing my job, right? But uh, it can have such an impact on people. But uh, more than that, there were two aspects in the story, right? One aspect was that she not being able to fulfill her dream because she's going to get, get married and she has no other option, but she doesn't have a choice. And nobody really uh, cares, right? Nobody really cares because, and that's why I, I, I chose this topic in urban society, because we count numbers these days. Oh, we have so many women in court. So it does not matter if Rifa D cannot come to court to practice because we, are, we already have the numbers. So that's what is happening these days. And that's why uh, discrimination is way more rampant. It's, it's invisible. The invisibility really, really is, is, is problematic. And that's all the more unbearable because it's, it's invisible and it, it will kind of eat up the society from within and we won't even get to know it has made it so hollow because we will be just counting numbers. That's one. The second aspect that the story uh, made me feel was, and again, this was something that I was already feeling, that's the invisibility part, right? We have been enablers and fixers for such a long time, supporting men to do what they do. And we're very happy doing that. How many women do we know who are in leadership positions? Again, you will count numbers, but the kind of hardship they have faced to reach there, the kind of prejudices they have been subjected to. And even now, are they encouraged? Are they, are they being, being appreciated for the initiatives they take or do they have to face the same hurdles again and again every day? What happens to their mental health? Have we ever thought about that? Is the question again? We count numbers. We don't see how that how many women are able to climb up the ladder. How many men can accept women in leadership roles? How many men can accept confident women walking around them? How many men can take orders from a woman? Is the question. If a woman is giving directions, if the woman is taking initiatives just as men do it's not acceptable women have to strategize women have to navigate these spaces in a manner they have to think how to get the work done so that it it's it's done actually and so that they are not seen as difficult women right so i think these are the issues that has emerged in urban society now and discrimination should be looked at differently in light of this development when more and more women are coming to work, but that in itself does not mean that they are not being discriminated against. So to uh, help in understanding this, I also thought that let me uh, look at law and see how does law, how, how, how can law be said to, can law address this? 
to what extent policy matter, it is a policy matter and to what extent can the author say. Uh, let's see. So Article 14 would say the state shall not deny to any person. The state shall not deny to any person. I have always emphasized on the word deny because when you are denied of something, it's really unbearable. There's one thing, if something is absent, it's all right, but denial is something that affects your sense of dignity. And therefore, the state shall not deny to any person equality before the law. Equality before the law, as we all would understand that the law is going to treat everyone equally, right? there won't be any preferential treatment. Or the equal protection of the laws within the territory of India. Now, how do we look at this phrase equal protection? Generally, how we have understood earlier as laid down in, in judgments, it would mean equal protection would mean uh, like people should be treated like. That's it, which is fine. But as we've also seen, equality is a dynamic concept and over a period of time it was developed. So if we have to look at this phrase, equal protection of the laws now in the context of Rifat B and the, the, the way women are being, being invisible, then can we bring, bring interpret equal protection in such a manner so that we can see that the law guarantees that we cannot be we have to be treated in a manner that we, we are also uh, able to exercise our, our rights at par with men, right? So equal protection, of course, so far what has happened in the area of equal protection is we have had Porsche Act, we have had DV Act. These are obviously, these are, uh, equal, these are to ensure that, that uh, women are getting equal protection of the laws so it does not really mean that there has to be the same law for everyone, but if at all a certain kind of protection is required for a certain uh, group, then you can have law for that specific group, for instance. Um, and therefore it would ensure equal protection. So equal protection would not just mean formal equality, but there has to be an element of substantive equality. In it. And that's, Further substantiated when we see uh, clause three of, of Article 15, which talks about special provision for women and children. So the state can make special provisions for women and children so that they can receive equal treatment. Right? Uh, again, Article 15 is kind of you know, goes further to say that the state shall not discriminate. Now, another problem that happens, and this is, I'm not, I, I want to bridge the gap between law and, and what happens in society. Um, so we were once having a discussion in the courtroom, and I think it was in the context of CA, et cetera, when somebody said, you know, I can, huh, somebody said that the, the clerk is to be treated in the manner that a clerk is to be treated and the associate should be treated in the manner associated should, should be treated. There cannot be an equality between them. And uh, I was a bit puzzled that what about equality that the constitution talks about and he says, no, but that's for the state. That's equality before law. So it's just that they have to be treated, the law has to treat them equally, equally and we are not under an obligation to treat people equally is what a lawyer's understanding was, and that really disturbed me, because all that the chapter of fundamental rights does is it imposes an obligation on the state. So now states can make law. After that, the government, so, so basically any government enterprise has to follow it. It cannot discriminate, but what happens with private companies then? So for that, of course, we have Porsche, we have, we have all sorts of of uh, uh, law, but we, we don't have uh, any law that would say, uh, hey, of course, there cannot be discrimination, et cetera, but we cannot say, hey, but you know what? This woman was eligible. This woman is way more capable than that man. Then why was not she promoted? So now, so the, the problem is, is twofold. One is how do you enforce it against private parties? 
And the other is even with, with government entities, how do you really question when two people are equally capable or maybe woman is more capable and still there are certain personal characteristics or, or some sort of preference. You know, it can be unconscious biasness even, even unconscious biasness that can lead to the man being promoted and not the woman. So even though on paper we are talking about non-discrimination, we're talking about equal opportunity, but in practice, to what extent it's happening is has always been a question in my mind. And that's where policy can pitch in. Uh, that's where awareness drives can pitch in, where people are made aware of their unconscious biases. Because most people think they're not. They are not biased. Most people think they are the most, most, kind of, uh, you know, where they respect women and that's enough. They are all for women empowerment and that's enough. And they don't realize actually what they're doing. In practice, I'll give you a small example. So uh, we just hired a woman lawyer and she's 25 and she's married. So uh, I was told, uh, so I'll just uh, stop sharing this for a while and then I'll I share the story. Yeah, so she she was uh, she's married. She's 25. She's married, and uh, this person. Uh, so she tells me. So we were having this interaction, and, and she tells me that she was rejected just because she was married. And, and I think it, it, she had applied two, three places before us, and uh, she was just because they were like, "Why are you married?" It it seemed as if. Uh, if you're married, if a woman marries at the age of 25, she's not ambitious enough. Or it is seen that, oh, you'll soon have kids, right? So how will you contribute? So all of these personal biases come in a way that men are really even not aware of that, that this is, and they think that this is a reality and they need to take into account, right? So uh, like, one of the questions that even my colleagues sometimes ask, and I have to tell them that you cannot ask this question, is that, oh, will you be able to stay beyond certain hours, right? So if the woman says no, then what happens? So, and therefore, in litigation, you find fewer number of women in the first place because already the society, already the parents have created that in her mind that, you know, you have to stay there for long hours. So it's not meant for you. That's number one hurdle, if she manages to cross it. And, and then they also say, and that has happened even in my office, this, there was this girl from Orissa, she, she told me, oh, my parents are saying, what will happen to your work-life balance? I'm like, it hasn't, that problem hasn't come yet. We'll see when it comes, right? So, and given that I'm somebody who's, who's, who knows how to accommodate, and I think I know, um, and of course, when the situation arises, that will test my ability to accommodate. That won't test the person's ability to be accommodated. That will test my ability to accommodate. And trust me, each need requires different kind of accommodation. And sometimes even that person may not be able to express what they need. Because the society doesn't work, work like that. The society is so homogeneous. They consider everything to be so homogeneous that, that they don't really appreciate the differences. And they don't really, so you, you, it does not occur to people that this is, needs to be accommodated. I have a right to reasonable accommodation. It really doesn't occur. And uh, they're, in, in fact, uh, people with disability, they can sometimes be ashamed of themselves. So much so because of the conditioning that they may not even be able to express what they need. Uh, they may not even themselves know, forget about expressing, they may not even themselves know that if I'm provided this, this will help me, right? And therefore it's important for people, for employers, for employees to have those regular interactions. What's the difficulty? How it can be accommodated? Only then we can ensure that there's no discrimination in absence of these kind of reasonable accommodations. And, and in fact, RTWD says, and as, as Man mentioned, the language is this, that it would constitute discrimination if reasonable accommodations are not provided. So I think it should be even applied to gender aspects as well in places of employment if they are not being accommodated. And I have seen that massive difference. So there's a law firm 
where uh, there is a, a partner who is who's really accommodative and she has crush and everything there and uh, she really uh, interacts with women and sees what they need etc so women are able to uh, continue to work even after uh, they have a child whereas in other law firms we see more and more women leaving their jobs even though on paper they are you know equal opportunity uh, firms so so that becomes important at the stage in urban society to not just look at numbers but also see whether we are what we are doing with our personal biases how we are addressing them because when we talk about equal opportunity it means uh, opportunities where there are no stereotypes opportunities where there are no such barriers that come in the way of women because it makes it doubly hard so it's, it should, would be way easier for me to sit at home rather than i i being said oh you need to go out and prove yourself but you know what we won't let you prove yourself so that's that's worse that's even worse so uh, as i was just now showing article 16 article 16 is what talks about equal protection in employment e equality of opportunity in employment right so again it's it's just government employment but but then policies can help and stringent policies requiring even private parties to have have policies just like we have sexual harassment policies i think every establishment it should be mandatory for every, every establishment to have equal opportunity policies as well and it should be also mandatory to have education to have awareness to to show them through videos and through that how it looks like right how prejudices look like in practice how stereotypes look like in practice because without that education both men and women do not know that they exist and it's affecting them right and it affects them from the very childhood the level of confidence now if you, if you see how many if you look at your workplace and, and you see how men are performing women are performing you realize that they may be women may be putting in double the effort women may be better than i'm saying maybe i'm not saying they always are but since they have have had a baggage that they have to prove themselves that they are not good enough sometimes they're better than men sometimes they're more sincere than men but when it comes to showcasing their work sometimes they lack confidence so i think that's also important wherever you are whatever you are doing to empower these women so that whatever condition they have had in the past they can come come over it right? they and those those can be addressed uh, the other bit is cause huh so uh, one thing that i was talking about invisibility in leadership roles now now the less number of women we see in these leadership roles the more difficult it is for the women to go, reach there and to be leaders because there's a constant hindrance now let's understand what these these hindrances can be like so uh, one is of course uh, ability to take risks now many there are less number of women entrepreneurs than men right even if you look at the ratio it's less um so what stops them right so i i don't know i have been thinking about this since the time i started my own firm and people were like oh my god you have started your own firm you being a woman and then something some and it really needed a kind of push and it took me a while it took me a couple of years to to prepare myself for this because i i don't know what was stopping me right and then i started thinking what happens actually why are men more prepared why is it that men start in a bit of practice sooner than women and some women don't even start their own practice and then they leave litigation so what actually happens so one of the things that happen of course is when you go to court you argue you treat it differently and i think i should say it in as many words because again nobody realizes that you are being treated differently and what it's doing to you but uh, you are treated differently and and uh, that really doesn't work and that really affects your level of confidence it affects your ability to take initiative uh, the other aspect can be when you're growing up when you're growing up a uh, woman uh, tend to girls tend to stop playing at a very early age right 
So now, while men are involved in adventurous kind of sports, right, even jumping, right, so it's, it involves overcoming fear and doing something. So I have a feeling that these kind of physical activities, when, when women stop doing it at a very early age, can also affect their ability to take risks. Uh, I don't know if there's a direct connection, but I have a feeling that there should be. Apart from that, of course, the conditioning where men are constantly controlling your actions, you tend to think that you cannot do anything by yourself, even though you are not very conscious about this. But automatically, each time you want to do something, you want to ask somebody, you want somebody to tell you to do it, and only then you do it. So, so taking your own initiative, that it hampers that. And so, so that's why when certain women start to take initiative, then it again bothers people and they just can't accept how can she, and they, again, it doesn't show up in that manner. It, they think, oh, you're a difficult person. People can't work with you. You are not a team worker. All that happens in the end is the woman who has to bear the brunt of it, uh, just because there are not many women around who are doing exactly what you do, right? So, and you think you're just doing normal stuff, right? Like me speaking at a webinar, like the way I'm speaking right now, it's normal for me, but it can affect the confidence of men because not many women are doing it. So this is something that we're facing in, in urban society. These, these uh, spaces have to be navigated and negotiated by women constantly. I mean, this is something that needs to be addressed now. And uh, because we have reached a point where we've empowered women to do certain things, and we, we've come to a point where we, where we know oh, them women are now in each in urban society. They're empowered enough, they can do, do their stuff. But to what extent are men prepared to, to handle that, that those powerful women is a question. And therefore, sometimes women also disempower themselves so as to fit in, in the society so that they don't make men feel insecure about it. It affects the, uh, the productivity of the team as well, right? Because you're investing in women. As, a, as an entity, I'm investing in the women employees, but if they don't perform as well because of their conditioning, it's, it's affecting me as well. So it's important for employers to understand this also while devising their equal opportunity policy. Um, the other aspect is uh, that I almost got covered and I call it Tumsena Hupayla, right? So that's something that's either being said to women in as many words or it's, it's implied that, okay, yes, fine, you've prepared this, but let me present it. Because you know, there will be so many people there huh? and you don't have experience. So let me present this. Or, uh, okay, let him go because uh, he can handle it, right? So even if he's junior to you, he being a man, and I'm not really conscious that this is what is behind my thought process, um, he will handle it better. Somehow, uh, somehow, you need a man, right? So all of that, you have, all, you have to run around in cartoons, and therefore let a man go, right? Uh, we don't have a woman clerks in courts. So again, there are certain rules where women are not considered uh, fit, and uh, women are not even trained for those positions. So there are fewer rules. So the, the role that women gets to have is, is maybe in, in a law office would be that of a receptionist. So the rules get fewer in number. And the, the positions are such where, so obviously a trained, a skilled clerk would earn more than just a receptionist who's taking calls, right? And this happens, I think, everywhere. Even, for example, in, in hotels, and I remember somebody saying, oh, hostess job, right? Somebody who offers flour, only women get to do it. But they would say, Oh, you know, those positions are only given to women. They have, they have to do nothing with the stuff is mine and hand over the rules. But they are also getting paid less, far, far less. Whereas you'll find mostly waiters, though in our houses, women are cleaning and, and women are the ones who are serving food, waiters mostly would be men. In our houses, it's the primary response, it's the primary response to a woman to cook, whereas you'll find chefs are all men. So that's what I'm hitting at in this session that we really, really need to see 
where we, as an urban society, where we are in terms of treating women equally. Thank you. I think I'm, I'm ready for questions, if you could allow some questions. Can't hear you, ma'am. You'll have to unmute yourself. Thank you, Advocate Sanchita, for a very erudite presentation. Uh, there is only one question by Ishika. It is about the menstrual leave. And she asked with, uh, uh, whether uh, this will empower women, the period sleeve will empower women and uh, impact if their position. I have a couple of questions. One is that, can you highlight some of the landmark judgments which have created a very positive environment ecosystem for women in the uh, labor market, uh, both in organized and unorganized sector? And secondly, this whole exercise which young feminist lawyers are doing of rewriting the judgments. Can you just tell that how, how this creative exercise uh, results in creating a discourses towards uh, equality and equity? And also the what has been the learning of feminist praxis over the last 40 years, because this uh, women and work has been a very important uh, area of feminist intervention. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you for the questions. Uh, Isha, I think you have, uh, I think menstrual leaves are one of the kind of reason recommendations that I was talking about. Uh, it will empower women or will it impact their position in comparison to men? So that's why we need to understand first that these are not kind of, so, so like a woman being pregnant or requiring maternity leave, it's, it's not hampering the, uh, so, so the employers who see it as, as uh, you know, just very, 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 that's a very narrow approach to have to, in terms of how much revenue are we making. So if a woman goes on leave, then what happens? But when you have a, have a broader view to it, when you, you get to see there will always be somebody to, to cover up, right? For example, right now, after these two months uh, of taking care of my mother, I was completely out of office and my partners were like, doesn't matter. This is what, this is also, it's, and it's irrespective of gender. Anybody can need to take these kind of leaves, right? My brother had to for a month. Um, so, so then what happens? What happens is when, uh, again, when I came back, now I have PTSD. Everyone in my office is contributing. They are trying to do, you know, cover for me. That's possible, right? And, and it does not matter which gender you, uh, even paternity leave, for example, can be taken. So, so, so whoever is, has to take, take leave for whatever reason, I don't think that that will have any bad, but you need to educate people. Otherwise, they will think the way they do. Um, therefore, even before hiring a woman, they would, they would feel like, oh, this will cause problem, this will. So therefore, uh, not giving menstrual leave is not the solution, but to educate people and to, to, to encourage them to have such policies in place, I think that's the need of God. I think we need to create a kind of culture where everyone wants to, to become that equal employer, equal opportunity employer. That's uh, uh, like people self-project on LinkedIn that we are doing this, we have earned this much this year, we have made this much money. They should be able to project themselves as, oh, we have done this for our women employees this time. And so everyone would want to do it so that they can also do it. I think this kind of culture needs to be created. Yeah. Right. So the second question was on uh, landmark cases. I think nothing can take the place of Vishaka, uh, right? Because it talked about right to live with dignity, something that was seen as, as you know, sexual harassment was not even an offense at that time. And to see it as something that's affecting just those gestures just like the, the definition was very narrow in, in IPC when we were talking about outraging modesty and stuff. But what this judgment did was even those kind of gestures that and the impact it has on women, right? It highlighted that. And we can use that judgment time and again to create equal opportunity for women in every sector. Of course, there, there are other judgments that led to the passing of legislations, et cetera. But I think this still stands up. Because this judgment came first and then the legislation came, right? Otherwise, what happens? You have a legislation, its implementation is problematic, and therefore you go to the court. But 
even this is possible that you take an issue to the court and then the court says that no this is not done this has to be rectified so i think this is how we can expand the definition because equality is a dynamic concept it has evolved over time and it's because of the judiciary that it has evolved and thankfully we have a very very sensitive judiciary and at least supreme court so we we have uh, this opportunity to take these kind of issues and uh, to to let them expand to to interpret it in a manner that expands the definition and such policies can then be framed based on the guidelines that the court issues yeah and then uh, my my yeah rewriting judgment uh, rewriting judgment i uh, didn't quite understand what you meant by it. yeah there are many there, there is a group which is created which okay. says that how can you may come up with a gender responsive judgments huh, because so right, many right. recently we have received so many misogynist judgments right from the time of mathura rep case till right. now right so, so how this it... was in fact one of my papers that i presented in women's studies department um, when i was a student here that i had analyzed all the uh, rape judgments that had come post mathura to see what changed or what did not change so i realized that those uh, uh, what is that word for it voyeuristic yeah that remained and trust me the language was such that i mean if if i was eating something i would want to puke right um there was such vivid description and it was and the description was such that oh he jumped on the woman like a wolf things like that and the woman was you know like those kind of description where you know uh, very 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 hurrying uh, and and with the judges didn't even realize they thought they were doing uh, they were writing it well because they were showing women as victims and stuff but uh, it was very difficult to put through those judgments uh, with time what happened was with time uh, those kind of language went away not because the judges realized something but because a uh, kind of copying pasting thing started and you know the same paragraphs of judgments were being being and they said the supreme court gave a directive also no what not to use ha that's 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 there so that happened only after uh, 2013 amendment and stuff but even before that uh, i realized that, that just because we have now researchers etc in supreme court so the way judgments are being written has changed so because of that only those paragraphs that were uh, substantial paragraphs so that were the findings of uh, given in previous uh, judgment those were basically just taken you know without going into so much into facts uh, that was a development that happened even before 2013 amendment Uh, of course before 2013 uh, post mathura also there was uh, there were certain amendments in criminal law because of which you know the uh, certain you could not have asked questions for example on character of the woman that was not relevant anymore but uh, then these kind of words kept being used another thing that happened was uh, whenever there was a rape and murder they would say that it was not uh, premeditated she was murdered only because he didn't he wanted to destroy evidence there was nobody around no eyewitness and therefore she would have justified it instead and therefore she was murdered there was no and and there was a whole lot of explanation around it that how it was not premeditated okay and then even when uh, the, the sentencing was being decided Uh, oh, the accused has parents. The parents are amazing. He has to take care of parents, right? There was this Pune case, horrible case. He had Only raped his right. own um, relative, and and it was done in, a, in such a brutal manner. And then everyone was killed and stuff. And then the court is saying, it does not matter what sentence. It can be that they are against death penalty. They want to give life. It's all right, but to say that no, the the boy's parents are like amazing people. They need to be taken care of, and he's the only son. I just couldn't believe that thing he said. Yes. So uh, these things were happening, and then Nirbhaya happened. Then 2013 amendment came, and now there has been that shift that we all. Experience.
expecting and uh, they are they, they're being written more responsibly and since all of this has been expressly incorporated in the in the law itself some of it uh, like voyeurism is now uh, an offense and therefore even judges are careful about the language they use so uh, so we have seen this change um, it has been gradual it has been because constantly civil society was raising its voice on how things should be done and how things should not be done because see you need to accept that judges are also part of the society so sometimes they also need to be told that you know this is how it is and this is how it should not be and then when you tell them then they understand that but the problem is people who argue the cases should and therefore thankfully we have certain uh women and they're, they're very feisty women lawyers who get to do that but uh, with other uh, like with disability etc we're facing this problem that uh, not many people are able to uh, to to put across the case in a manner as it should be done and also with other marginalized uh, communities minority communities i think it's important and therefore it's important that we have this kind of equal opportunity measures in place so that we have more more women judges yeah. not by way of reservation but because there are so many women women judges who deserve to be there in the supreme court and if uh, five women deserve then five women should be there if 10 deserve then should be there that's how it should be right and therefore we need to see where it's it's not there must be some problem somewhere which needs to be addressed it can be because of prejudice it can be because of stereotypical notions that people have and right. have Rajeshri Padhi, she has raised hand. Can you just come? Uh, you can ask your question, Madam Rajeshri Padhi. Yeah. Ma'am, I will uh, try to bring her, Anjula. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Meanwhile, yeah. meanwhile, we have uh, Dr. Simi Mehta. She will yeah. also ask a question, followed okay. by Ishika. Ishika will ask the question yeah. as a as a student. Uh, yeah. She is in Lady Sri Ram College and also is aspiring to be. How she is looking at it? I also wanted to add few things. Uh, since uh, we have different employment types, so we have self-employed women, casual labour women, and also regular wage or salaried women. So, how do you see from your angle that gender gap or those things? If you can also touch upon. So uh, now right. I invite Dr. Simi Mehta to add your question. We will collect few questions, then come back to um, uh, chair and our speaker. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Simi, over to you. I will try to bring uh, Rajshri Ma'am on the screen. thank you so much uh, good evening professor patel and uh, advocate sanjita thank you for this very very interesting and uh, passionate uh, presentation uh, i am deeply touched uh, i want to draw uh, the attention towards uh, the plight of the working women um, you know at all aspects which uh, dr arjun was just mentioning you know various uh, casual and all those so uh but uh, working women who are married and uh, you know where they are faced with the inevitable question of balancing work and um, and your um, household and also if um, they have to spend time in child care child rearing and child child bearing and child rearing and should they really choose to choose work and profession uh, because of their uh, their interest i would rather say not because of uh, situation that they have to really earn but they are really just interested in working um, the broader perspective that exists is that she is not good enough she is not caring enough or rather she is just too ambitious uh, and uh, not um, uh not a woman enough to you know uh, to uh, take care of the family responsibilities and this stereotyping is not non existent for uh, the new fathers for example and hence paternity leaves are not as long as maternity leaves although maternity leaves are also not very sufficient and this is not just in india but also in developed countries and uh, about when you raised questions about uh, points about women in positions of power yes there is a lot of prejudice and um, and once she is able to demonstrate her uh, her capacities and her capabilities it uh, it it often times is seen as threatening uh, to the established patriarchal norms and um, their uh, and their 
contribution is sought to be uh, demonized and oftentimes their positions and their uh, entire um, contributions are snapped off so you know this is how my my broader and subjective point here is how long should we continue to allocate the causes of such um, facets uh, and such sufferings on the lives of women on patriarchy you know that this person is patriarchal whether woman or man uh, how long can we do it and of course we are witne witnessing a snail paced progress but um, Uh, but uh, there is hardly anyone as you mentioned that uh, would say that i am not for women empowerment they would every time they would say that yes empowerment but it is in the little and behavioral attitudes which uh, shows otherwise so would you agree with this point that it is uh, not in the biology but it is rather in the consciousness um and uh, i am just asking a very curious question as to uh, do you find your yourself being impatient at times when you really want when you know the causes when you know everything and um, you really want things to change immediately and uh, it is really the right time that things manifest in the way that uh, everything is normal so yeah thank you again no, thank, thank you, you thank you so much these were very interesting questions and and very interesting insights as well dr mehta thank you for bringing them up um All right. So to take your last point first, um, yeah. So I feel very, very impatient. But my problem is, I feel very impatient only when I suffer it, and it stays in my mind, right? I mean, stays in my mind. I keep talking about it. Then I start empowering women, and I haven't stopped since then. Since the time it has hit, it hit me the way it has. when somebody said you know what you write it for me and i'll present it because you don't know how to do it even after doing so many uh, webinars you don't know how to do it therefore you know what let me do it right and let me do it but i don't know what to say so you write it but i'll do it so that's why i said you know what this is what has been happening right and that's why we have so few again councils in supreme court in even in other courts and lower courts you find More number of women councils are being councils, but as we go higher, the, the the numbers reduce. Why? Why when women are putting in so much? I mean, they prepare briefs, they prepare everything. Why don't they ask you? And then I realize, no, this is there, right? And since the time I realize this is there, I haven't stopped working with women, not just talking. So uh, as you rightly said. Uh, To what extent can you say, oh, this person is patriarchal? I stopped saying that. I started working on the solutions, on just having a very, very solution-centric approach, right? So, suppose a client comes to me, I would give him a solution, right? I won't say, oh, this is happening because of this reason. Full stop. No, we've said enough. Everyone knows, right? And those who don't want to accept, they won't accept. Right now is what can be the solution to it. So, my solution, of course, is. Whoever's life I can touch, I will touch. I'll keep talking about it, uh, right? I make my interns, women interns, sit. And I tell them, I ask them what they want to do in life, and when they say, "Oh, and I can work anywhere," I say, "Why not tier one law firm?" They're like, "No, but you know, I can learn more maybe elsewhere." Then I ask them to look whether this choice of yours is affected by some conditioning, by somebody pulling you back at some point in your life. right so that's how we work with people these days uh, but i haven't yet have uh, i haven't got an access to work with men uh, but yeah to some extent i navigate these spaces i negotiate these spaces and you can go so much of negotiation every day when somebody comes and tells you you know this is how it's to be done and you're like ha huh, okay now how do i tell him that i know this but i feel you know it's, it's the other way out. Right. So, how do you disagree with uh, men without uh, being difficult? Is something we navigate every day, right? So, how does that stop? That stops when you are again. It's not just for women to do it, and therefore there should be other ways of educating men at an early stage. even when they come for employment and therefore it's the policy has to be there therefore the policy is it should be made mandatory these days we're talking about diversity and inclusion policy but uh, we need to have equal opportunity kind of policy where the 
standard of behavior should be in such a detailed manner so that a man can read and say, ah, this is what I do. Right? This is problematic. I didn't know this is problematic. Something of that sort. Education videos, it can be, like anybody can do that, right? It may not just be, be uh, us professionals, uh, people from the, the creative, uh, you know, if you have artist friends, you can encourage them. We just have started encouraging people to, to go stuff on ableism, right? So we don't see much of, we still see gender stereotyping being questioned through, you know, videos and stuff. But what about ableism, you know, for example, in movies, why don't we review, why don't we critique them, uh, just as we do for gender, uh, so, uh, so I've, I've been encouraging people to do that. So we can also do that. We can make those kind of uh, creative videos. We can make those, we can have those kind of sessions wherever we are, whatever we are doing, we can have those kind of sessions uh, where both men and women can get to see what we are doing, right? And how it's affecting us. So sometimes it also helps to understand the impact it's having. It's not, because otherwise this power structure is very, very convenient for men, right? Why would they want to change it? So you also need to understand the impact it's having on the productivity. The, because or you, are, you are investing resources in those women who are working for you. Then why not do something else further? Why not, you know, shape yourself in a certain way uh, that these women can perform better maybe, uh, or they get the kind of space where they grow and they, uh, just like a main camp. Uh, so that's very subtle, but it's important to, to educate in a way that will be. So we, just like we have posh these days, it's mandatory to have training sessions. We can have those kind of training sessions mandatory as well as what equal opportunity, as, as a part of equal opportunity policy. Everywhere there should be pasted on the wall what equal opportunity policy is. And then you should be training all your employees. You should get trained yourself how you should be treating, how you can get rid of irrelevant personal, how you won't let your decisions get affected by irrelevant personal characteristics, whether it be of a woman, whether it be of a, of a person with disability or of a certain community. It's important to be very, very conscious about it when you're sitting in one of those positions. It's important to educate them how it looks like when you do it. Otherwise, they won't understand ever and ever only. Right. So, uh, and caregiver. Um, so that's something very, very uh, deeply rooted in, in the way our society functions. And that has to be started right from, so this time when my parents were sick and I was taking care of them, at every point I was thinking, my brother has the best of his intentions, but he's not able to help me. He's feeling awful, he's feeling inferior. He's creating obstacles for me, but he's not able to help me. So what can we do differently in our houses so that you know the responsibility of taking care is not just on women? Why not the moment? And I think we do it, but we don't do it as often as we should be doing it. That we involve men in in doing the jobs that you know generally we, we casually say we ask a, a girl to to give something to the to, to her brother. Instead of doing that, very conscious if you ask the boy to come and help you in the kitchen or, uh, or those kind of things that, oh, somebody is not well, oh, then you need to sit and take care, right? So those kind of things, I think if, if we, we can shift those uh, roles in our houses a bit to, to, to so that it's not just woman's primary responsibility to take care, so that the woman is not under pressure in future. She's and it's it's not like of course when I'm uh, when I'm single it's different. I can take care of my parents and stuff. But uh, say I'm married and then it becomes a problem because I have to. I feel guilty if I don't take care of my of my in laws. And I also have office where they're not going to give me leave. Then what happens? To what extent can I then ask my husband to do it? Because I have not been trained in my house to do that. I've been trained in my house to do it myself, to feel guilty if I don't do it, or by the society generally. So therefore, I think it's it's something that that will again take time. But we really need to uh, to train men 
to take care of each other and not just think for themselves. This is something which is happening a lot. I mean, they want to, but they don't know how to. So I think we need to kind of get to that place. Thank you so much. Thank you. Unorganized sector, again, so of course we have a domestic welfare, uh, domestic workers, again, domestic workers are primarily women, so we have a domestic workers registration, Social Security and Welfare Act. But uh, unorganized sector, we all know, I mean, it's, we have construction workers, uh, for example, that even women are, are involved in it. But unorganized sector, women suffer way, way more than men do. Uh, POSH again is applicable for uh, unorganized sectors, but uh, the kind of uh, discrimination that happens with women is way more. Um, also because women are not seen as primary bread owners, right? So that could also be in the back of the mind when they're not paid equally with men. So equal remuneration has always been a problem. Or it can be, what is at the back of the mind when they're not being paid? So even though you have all kind of laws, if it's not happening, then you need to think, why is it not happening? You need to, of course, know how to get it enforced because it's a law, it helps you. But uh, you also need to understand, uh, you also need to first empower these women so that they, they know how to get it executed. You also, because when women negotiate, they, are, they don't consider themselves in such a powerful position as men would. They are scared, there's an element of fear. And I have recently, very, very recently seen that in myself that I also have a risk. Men can, you know, uh, have way more confidence when they're negotiating. So that's again a problem and therefore women are paid less because again, the same thing happens. Their level of confidence is, is, is broken again and again and again and again. And therefore when they are fit to negotiate, their ability to negotiate is, is not uh, as good as men would have. Um, and uh, uh, so so we need to also work on uh, what happens with people when they think that uh, women are uh, not primary bread breadwinners. I have even seen men say, and even in those households, women say the same thing because women again uh, are not empowered enough and therefore they follow what men are saying and they think that's the truth. So. Uh, men would say, oh, women are taking jobs, which means men won't be able to do those jobs, right? Whereas men are responsible to take care of the family. So women are being unfair by taking those jobs. So if this is the kind of thinking process, then I'm sure that is affecting the organizational sector as well. Um, so so uh, I think education is, of course, part of it. But that in itself does not help because if, if a certain job can be done by paying less, they would obviously pay less, they would want to pay less. And therefore, law needs to be enforced. Um, there needs to, a lot of work needs to be done. Uh, courts need to be approached uh, because uh, right now th these areas are so neglected that uh, it's, it's important to regulate them to have proper legislations to govern them, and then also to enforce them, we need to keep going to the courts. We need to represent these women in courts so that they're enforced properly. In, uh, yeah, in this context, what would you, how would you evaluate the four labor codes? Correct. Um, shall we take some more questions? Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. so we yeah. have Rashi Padhi, ma'am, then Ishika, then Mahima, then Swati. Please yeah. try to be brief. Rashi, ma'am, over to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, good evening, yes. ma'am. Uh, I'm from Central University of Jharkhand, Ranchi. I would just yeah. like to, it is a wonderful uh, uh, talk when we speak about uh, judiciary. And uh, my question is that when we speak about urban women or gender equality, we hardly speak about, we often speak about the dichotomy between uh, public and private. And in the context of uh, presently in the urban society, we are more uh, doing our job online and we are victimized. And recently when we are speaking about the protection of uh, law from law, judiciary is not saying very widely what is actually about privacy. Uh, privacy is uh, 
what is privacy how privacy is defined because we are uh, victimized in a digital platform because we are also uh, now prone to online devices I would like to know how judiciary is going to have a role in it, in protecting women. Right. So, uh, if you could uh, explain me a little bit more, then I would be in a better position to tell you whether something is within your right to privacy, whether it's being violated, because I. Oh, it's not quite... about. Uh, it's not about my right to privacy. When it is about urban women, it is. We are more now. Uh, like okay, you're talking about data privacy and stuff. Yeah, data okay. privacy and women privacy in uh, the digital world and there is no protection of organization. There is no organizational data policy which is protecting women. And uh, because in private institutions like in the software companies they have, but in uh, educational institutions we don't have any uh, digital policies and women are abused. Uh, their data that are leaked, given to others, and uh, sometimes they are not uh, allowed to access the organization. Like it is a harassment, but it is like a digital harassment. Okay. So okay. I just like to know from you that what is law saying? Right. So see, can, can one... we take some more questions? Ha, sure. Okay. Right. okay. Ishika, yes. then Swati, then Maima. Yeah, Ishika. Thank you, my first question is that, that when as a student I hear these judgments by High Court and Supreme Courts, uh, specifically a judgment by the Bombay High Court a few months back that groping uh, without skin to skin is not sexual assault. Yeah. And that judgment really hit it to my core because I was like that if, if judges are thinking like this, how will a society change? Yeah. And ma'am, recently like Guwahati High Court uh, granted divorce to a man on the pretext that her wife doesn't wear Sindhu and Mangasutra. So these kind of judgments like really shatter me to my core, like what kind of judgments are our judges like who are so educated and who are at the pedestal where they can take decisions and like they can like bring reforms in a society, like what kind of judgments are they saying? And my, my second question is that uh, when you talked about the, like how women are perceived as like they have to do the household work, it's mandatory for us. So ma'am, recently Kamal Hassan's party in Kerala, they brought up a provision that women should be paid for their household chores. So ma'am, there was a controversy around that also. For example, if you're paying women, then it basically stereotypes it more. That less, yes, women have to do it, but now you are being paid. It's just, it's just that difference. So ma'am, like, what's your opinion on that? Like paying women for the household work, will it solve the whole scenario? And will it like change the societal structures? So, yes, so, really, the cash transfer, and that was Tamil Nadu, uh, Assam, Maharashtra, many states are also coming with such uh, schemes, policies. Now, Swati, over to you. Uh, thank you for your insights, ma'am. Uh, my first question is, uh, so the government has uh, made different provisions, like reservation to women in uh, politics and different different fields so uh, but we have seen that women always have been a uh, like back burner this is like they haven't been able to utilize this these kind of provisions at the fullest so uh, how do we correct such imbalances uh, and my second question is ma'am that uh, we have seen that during the pandemic okay so firstly we know that uh, when a women get educated the whole family gets educated and i think that's the way how we tackle uh, these kind of issues that we have like gender inequality and the things that we talked about that how uh, women are mostly burdened with the household chores and uh, male are, don't share the equal responsibility in that cases. So uh, if we talk about how important education is, so during the pandemic, there has been, we have seen uh, many like large dropout ratios of women from schools. And uh, as well, we have also seen families marrying their uh, daughters early nowadays because you know there are a lot of reasons behind that. So how do we tackle uh, such kind of issues? That's my question. Right. So, so you have one this. More uh, huh. One more question from Maima. Sure, sure. Maima is having some connection issues. Maima, unmute. Don't worry about video. Uh, yes, sorry for the technical Go issues. Go on. Uh, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so time and again, the issue of pay parity, 
comes to the center stage, especially in the urban areas. And as you mentioned about uh, the workplace emotions of a woman that they don't consider um, themselves as more confident and they sometimes even self-reject uh, for opportunities and among other things. So what is your take on that? And how? what is the way forward in combating pay parity? Right. So Thank you. I think, uh, any more questions or uh, should we go ahead with answers? Madam yeah. Padi, no? Madam Padi wanted to ask. Uh, Rajshri ma'am has asked. Uh, ma'am, do you want to add? No, 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 no. Okay. I just asked. I put. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. okay. The pay, yeah. pay parity, yes, really. Right. Okay. So, so two issues. One was pay parity, and the other one was reservation. Now, reservation already exists. Equal remuneration act already exists. Now, why is it still not being enforced properly? Of course, if there are women who want to go to court, like the other day I was, I was watching a, a documentary. Uh, it was on a woman who had uh, challenged the bonded labor system. And she was herself a uh, bonded labor. And initially she was, uh, she believed that, you know, this is how it is because she's a bonded labor. So but she should be treated well, even though she's, you know, she has to because she's, somebody had taken a loan and that, you know, Bayaj Barra and therefore she has to pay. And this is in Rajasthan. But, and this is before the act, etc. came. So she's thinking, no, but we should not be tortured, you know. We need to be allowed to work. And then the women were also raped and stuff. So all those things should be happening. So from there, she came to a point where she started understanding and she became so... Uh, uh, I don't know how that sensitization process worked because the whole village was uh, body labor and everyone believed that they are supposed to do this. So uh, whoever went in, however this education happened, and this woman understood that there's something seriously wrong with this and we should not, we have a right to be free. And just this thought, because of this thought, she then started negotiating with these um, employers, takedars, and she started saying, but why did you do this to that woman? Why did you do that to that man? From there, then she went to meet the CM with a uh, full, you know, with, with the team. And then they explained that this is what is happening. And then you saw all the, the major acts and everything that came and then we don't have what it never is more in that there. So Otherwise, it was so so there for them. It was like, oh, ye parchi hai. Like just on your parchi, it's written this much amount, and they are thinking that they have to work for the rest of their lives, and then their children have to work for the rest of their lives because of that parchi, right? So, uh, so I think this kind of indoctrination is part of, uh, and this is not just this is like a big issue where there was just one big thing that you had to bring. But when it comes to to, to pay parity, when it comes to, to a woman's participation in politics, there's so many, so many subtle layers of it, of it that you need to break. So much of internalization that has happened with this woman themselves, that even if you, uh, you tell them, they would be like, but this is how it, it should be. This is how it is. How can we do something different, right? So that internalization effects, and therefore you need to first intervene there in educating them so that they, they can see for themselves and then they can enforce it, right? They can enforce it at various levels. It's not just by going to court, but just by keeping the foot down that, no, this is what I want for myself. When I am I am the political representative, I am the political representative. Why, why don't you let me decide? She's able to say that, but in order to, for her to be able to say that, a whole lot of things needs to be done. There has to be education, there has to be empowerment, there has to be at all levels, right? So there has to be that kind of an intervention that, that it's required. And you also need to understand that this is a power structure. So it's, it won't get broken just by educating men. It, you need to fight it out. Because anybody who is at the top wouldn't want to give it up. So even if it's a woman of, of our upper class, 
she wouldn't want to give it to a woman of a lower middle class, right? She would have the same problem that men would have. So it's not just patriarchy, it's the power structure that you're operating against. And the only way to do it is to keep putting your foot down, not just educating, not just educating. Education is definitely a part of it, but you also need to remember this all the time that nobody is going to hand it over to you. And you see any movement, any workers' movement anywhere in the world, it was never handed to them like this. There was always a movement, there was always a struggle behind it that led to it. So we should be ready for that, we should be prepared for that. We just can't sit and say, oh, this is a problem we are facing. Everyone's facing. Now, what should we do? No, we just need to keep keep acting on it. It's the only way to deal with it. We need to make people uncomfortable. And that's the only way. We need to assert, right? Again, women are not, not you know, encouraged to assert. The moment you, as you assert, you're going to feel so bad that you've said something wrong. You need to improve on your communication skills. So you need to be able to support each other and keep asserting. This is how it is, and this is how it should be. And that's how you can enforce this. Right? Um, privacy at organizational level, I think you need to again fight for it because you have a right to be treated equally. If you're discriminating against, then you need to fight for it. Right? At whatever level, wherever you find it, you need to organize yourself. You need to be able to, you need to, to, to be able to find that courage. To tell them because whenever you're up against an organization, it's always difficult, right? You're always made to feel you're doing something wrong. That's why it gets difficult. It's difficult to organize because everyone has their interest, everyone has their family to look after, they wouldn't want to get into it. So it's all difficult, but it's possible, right? I think these were the only oh judgments, yeah. So another thing is, as we were also discussing judgments given by Supreme Court earlier, that is a part of the society, you may not forget that. So just to think that, oh, he's a judge and therefore he should expecting. Um, so what we do as lawyers is we, uh, we prepare ourselves so that even if the judge has some, for example, I was arguing disability rights case and somehow in the background, it was like, to give a scribe to a person who needs it, it's a favor. Now, this was in the background and I had to show and just not tell that it's not a favor, right? That was one aspect. The other aspect was, what if it's invisible? So if you don't have a hand, it's visible and therefore it's fine to get a scribe. But if your hands are trembling, you still deserve a scribe. How do you break that uh, notion that comes? It's, it's a prejudice that, that was again getting reflected again and again. So even though I was trying very hard to explain how society is doing, what society is doing. So we just need to have better ways of explaining it when we are arguing for judges. We need to understand that they are also human beings and therefore it has to be argued in a certain manner. And again, there can be judges and we don't need to be disheartened because of because ultimately when it goes to Supreme Court, you know what happened for, in those cases. So there's always, uh, you know, because they're, they're human beings, they, they can be different. So uh, ultimately when justice is done, you should be happy about it. And it's not just, you know, gain, uh, lose faith and there should be so. Right, so thank you, ma'am. is speaking for almost one and a half hours. So. <laughs> Yes, uh, let us wrap, but before that, Vibhuti ma'am can give a concluding remarks on, on today's deliberation. Then Anshula will propose a vote of thank, Vibhuti ma'am. Or else if you want to add anything, ma'am, please unmute yourself also, please. Ma'am, please unmute yourself, Vibhuti ma'am. Ma'am, please unmute yourself, Vibhuti ma'am. Haven't I? Oh, yeah, uh, I have yeah, un no, unmuted, yeah, unmuted myself. Yeah, I think we had a very lively discussion and i think both the, the powerful presentation also led to powerful discussion and today is an extremely participatory where so many young women professionals also spoke from varied uh, fields of life and uh, i think the context whether that what when we say that there is a south in north and north in south i think that was also that wherever 
women are in the informal sector and especially it's not only the patriarchy but also the class caste even uh, uh, the poster of today's discussion which talks about that what is the uh, status of women manual scavenger uh, for last 15 months they have been fighting for their rights and nothing is happening. The fatality rate is so high. So invisibilization, non-recognition, controlled uh, private and public life, and also mental health issues, self-esteem and self-confidence of women in the workforce. I think the, the, this uh, very important concern that came out. And I think what we see the reflection of the same kind of stereotypical mentality, even in the current four labor codes, which were passed in April 2020, they were regarding the work, uh, workload, labor standards, occupational health, and uh, uh, wages, uh, and industrial relations. None of them even spoke about safety of women at workplace, None, uh, except for maternity leave, uh, there was hardly any mention of women even in the law. So if this is the what laws are saying and the ground reality as uh, Sanjita also brought out that uh, there are such a strong biases. It's not only employers biases, but even the biases of the family, how, how you invest in your daughter, uh, daughters, daughter-in-law, women in, of the family and what kind of work which you allow. I think we today, uh, the, the whole question is that of an urban situation and so uh, as compared to rural areas, urban women have found some more level playing field, uh, but still we have long way to go because without creating an ecosystem and in, from, uh, in terms of more gender responsive budgeting, affirmative actions, because mobility, currently the major concern that has come up is a mobility because it's a, oh, how far is your workplace? That is, a, uh, uh, and what kind of problems you face? That's very important. Some progressive measures like a cluster approach and hiring women, not in one and two, but in large numbers so that they, they can have agenda setting power and they can uh, also raise their voice. So that's very important. So enhancing women's agency, more by the self-mobilization, by awareness, and uh, uh, the way uh, she, uh, our uh, advocate uh, speaker today, she has said that a creation of awareness through various ways by and, and also bringing this agenda of women's inner world and uh, uh, more space for women in public and private domain, uh, that is very important. And also we need to change the gender norm. She had repeatedly told that it's very important and judicial activism of the eighties that we, we had experienced. I think we need to revive that kind of a culture even in judiciary. So even the discourses in the bar council or the women lawyers association, I think they also need to bring this kind of issue center stage. And I think media also has to respond, uh, educational institution, uh, uh, they're very important. And I think all of us know that uh, economic independence is the minimum necessary condition for a dignified life and all the guarantees that Constitution of India has given. So creating the uh, environment and also creating the community support for this kind of uh, equity, which leads us to equality is very important. I thank uh, 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 Advocate Sanchita and uh, Ishika Chaudhary, Dr. Simi uh, Mehta, uh, Dr. Arjun Kumar, Dr. Swati Solanki, Madam Padi uh, for making this today's uh, discussion very meaningful and enriched and all of us are now more enlightened about the current issues that urban women are facing. Over to Dr. Simi Mehta. Thank you so much, ma'am, for organizing such beautiful seminars, and uh, it is really informative. Yeah. Yes, right. So, Anshula, over to you. Yeah, ah. yeah. Thank you. So, I would really like to uh, thank our speaker and our chair for, um, as Vibhuti ma'am said, such a lively discussion and uh, through your views and your responses to all the questions. Um, you made it really um, a discussion touching on so many issues starting from this point of learning through the account of Rifat B going to so many issues. So thank you so much and uh, for really uh, helping us really stay true to the idea of addressing these gender gaps. So thank you. And so once formally on behalf of the IMPRI Gender Impact Study Center, I would like to thank everyone for joining us today for this uh, web policy talk. Um, thank you uh, to our speaker, Sanchita N for taking out the time to uh, share your experiences uh, through this talk on what does uh, equal treatment mean in an urban society. 
learning gender equality through the account of Rifat B. Uh, it was a pleasure having you. Thank you, ma'am. We are also grateful to Professor Vibhuti Patel uh, for taking out the time to chair today's session and as always enriching the deliberation. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you to everyone uh, who joined us and asked such pertinent questions. Uh, Dr. Samim Hetha, Dr. Rajshri Padhi, Swati, Ishika, Mahima, thank you. And of course, we are grateful to all our viewers who joined us here on Zoom or on Facebook Live or uh, who, whoever will watch later on YouTube or listen to this talk through our podcast. Thank you, everyone, and uh, I, good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.